So our next speaker, Victor Eldar, Dr. Victor Eldar, brings us to the world of microorganisms. Um, we all know bacteria, but uh, we uh, may not realize that bacteria have also social life. And actually, they can communicate or speak to each other. A language is um, uh, chemical, the so-called quorum sensing. And, uh, and actually, uh, the fact that those bacteria are social uh, is uh, uh, more than troublesome to uh, some of the cases uh, to human because some of the disease-making bacteria are social and their sociality is, um, is, is a block to, uh, to uh, uh, treating them. Uh, so Victor will talk about bacterial uh, Tower of Babel, uh, how cheating and lying diversita diversify a bacterial community. Please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, again, my name is uh, Victor Eldar, and probably I'm not known to most of the Tel Aviv folks as well because I'm new. I've just started on October in the microbiology department. And my laboratory in general works on uh, the systems biology of microbial uh, communities, trying to understand uh, microbial communities, the diversity, and functioning uh, using both computational and experimental approaches. And the story I'm going to tell you about today is one about communication. Now, communication and the diversification of communication and languages has been uh, an object of curiosity since early times, and even our own myths uh, relate to communication. And interestingly enough, uh, the divergence of communication, even in the Bible, is related to uh, separating uh, the cooperation abilities of, of us, of humans, uh, as, as, as is mentioned in Genesis, uh, in the story of the Tower of Babel. And what I will try and tell you today is how can we still learn some new insights about the divergence of very simple communication systems, even in the simplest creatures of all bacteria? Now, in order to do that, I will ob obviously have to introduce bacteria and bacterial communication, as well as bacterial cooperation, which is probably not known to uh, some of you. I will then uh, talk about uh, our main theoretical results, which explain how cheating and lying diversify communication systems in bacteria. And finally, if time will allow it, I may talk a little bit about preliminary experimental results uh, in an experimental system where we observe uh, this uh, model, as well as about uh, uh, future uh, experimental plans uh, with respect to this system. <laughs> so bacteria communicate, OK? And they do it by chemicals, of course. Now, the, the, the realistic communication networks that bacteria has are obviously quite complicated, but they can be summarized in a very, very simple uh, schematic model of communication, which is actually sufficient for uh, uh, the discussion today. And uh, the essence of communication in bacteria is that they have a signaling molecule, usually either a small molecule or a small peptide that they can secrete into the medium outside of the bacteria. And uh, this can accumulate in that medium, this, this uh, signaling molecule. Now they also have a receptor for this molecule, and if the level of molecule in the media is high enough, then the receptor, which is a kind of an ear, you can think about it, will sense the molecule and will, of course, elicit some kind of a response, which is basically the way they respond to this communication signal. Now, to a first approximation, uh, this kind of a behavior will lead to a density-dependent behavior of the community. And what do I mean by that? If we imagine a test tube, okay, that's a simple, although probably too simplistic, way of looking at bacterial life, uh, and we have only very few bacteria within this test tube, they will secrete only a little amount of signal, okay, which is maybe lower than the amount that the receptor can respond to. In this case, they wouldn't respond to the signal. If the same test tube has, has a much higher density of bacteria, they, it will also have a much higher density of signaling molecules, leading to a response in the bacteria by activating its receptor and downstream uh, responses. Now, 
there are many different types of responses uh, that are governed by this communication system in bacteria. Uh, and it is, might be worthwhile to mention again that also many pathogenic bacteria, disease-causing bacteria, are actually using these kind of communication systems in order to regulate their virulence. And here we have an example of uh, communities called biofilms, which are a chronic infection uh, communities of the bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa in this case. And you can see that without communication, when communication system is disabled, it looks completely different than when with the communication system is actually on. And it has been shown that communication is important. It actually say uh, today people are trying to develop uh, specific drugs that try to block or change the, the way bacteria communicate. Now, the observation that led to the work I'm going to tell you about today is the fact that this kind of a very simplistic language with a single word is actually diverging, and very quickly in some species. Now, what do I mean by that? I basically mean that if you, if you take a bacteria, for example, the bacteria Bacillus satilis, which is the model system I'm working with experimentally, and you take out of the ground where it lives two different strains, they have a good chance that their communication system will be different, okay? So it is the same genes, okay? They have just evolved to be different than each other, and we can easily identify uh, the two different strains based on molecular phylogeny to be uh, very different than each other, and the receptor has evolved together with the signaling molecule. Now, this evolution happens on a very fast time scale from an evolutionary perspective, much faster than most of the other behaviors, traits, or genes in the same respective species. So there's a mystery about this evolution. This is even more strong because it is also functionally different. These different strains of the same species do not understand each other. And what do I mean by that? If you take a bacteria, a, a, one strain, say the blue strain here, and you throw on it the blue signal, it will respond to it, okay? That's the signal it knows. And you will see strong response as, as, as has been shown experimentally. But if you take the same strain and throw on it the other signal, it won't recognize it, okay? So these are different languages and they somehow diverge again on evolutionary timescale, which is very quick, okay? Now, this leads to a question, okay? What underlies such a fast divergence of communication system in, in bacteria? And we can actually separate it into two different, but of course related, sub-questions. First of all, how can we co-evolve a signal and a receptor? Because in order to change this communication system from one to another, we need to change two things, of course. We need to change both the signal, which is the word we're using, but we also need to change our ear, okay, the receptor that the bacteria are using. Now, the problem is that the fundamental of evolution is that you cannot change two things simultaneously. You have to change them one after the other. This, of course, leads to a problem because now we have to consider a missing link, some kind of an intermediate bacteria which has one type of receptor but another type of signal. And this of course, by itself, is inactive because it speaks in a language it cannot understand. Now, the other question uh, is what is the advantage of, ha of having a different communication pathway? These are actually completely equivalent in terms of the bacteria. They just use a different language, be it French or the Japanese, but if they say the same thing, then who cares? Okay, so the second question is what happens once we have these two communication systems? What is the evolutionary uh, implication of having two instead of one? Now, in order to set a model that explains and answers these two questions, I have to bring uh, uh, another subject, which is basically uh, what is the response uh, of the bacteria. How do the bacteria use this communication and for what purposes? So it turns out that 
the main regulatory pathway that is being governed by this communication pathway is the control of secretion of other substances. What type of substances? So many different ones, depending, of course, on the specific bacteria. But for example, enzymes that help the bacteria digest complicated food that they cannot intake into their own cells. Okay, If you have, for example, a complex sugar like uh, a, a starch, and you need to cleave it into uh, the, the glucose uh, monomers, uh, you need to secrete an enzyme to do that. Uh, virulence factors, which is basically the same thing, but trying to eat us and not uh, potato. Uh, antibiotics that kills uh, other competitor bacteria. Okay? All of these secreted substances are oftenly regulated by these communication pathways. Now, from a social evolution perspective, these secreted substances can all be regarded under one basket, which is the basket of public goods. Okay? And in order to explain that, probably many of you know what are public goods, but I will try to at least explain it in a few words. Uh, think about taxes. Okay? Uh, public goods are not something that is specific to uh, bacteria. Imagine how you have to pay taxes when I talk about bacterial enzymes, then you may get an simpler version of the same story. So what do I mean when I say that a secreted enzyme is a public good? I mean that whenever a bacteria has to secrete an enzyme, it pays a cost. Okay? It has to produce this enzyme and pay a metabolic cost for its production. On the other hand, the benefit of this enzyme, because it is secreted, is out of the cell. And therefore, it is shared not only by the cell that actually makes the enzyme, but also by its neighbors. Okay? And this neighbor can benefit from this uh, monomer of sugar, for example, even if it didn't bother to produce the enzyme by itself. Okay? This is the classical definition of public goods. In the rest of the lecture, I will skip the drawing of the enzyme and so on and use a much simpler scheme, just showing the cost and the benefits of public goods and the different strains. And here, for example, we have a strain that both make the public good and, of course, enjoy it, but also a strain that doesn't make the public good. Now, public goods, such as these enzymes or human taxes, are, have a very uh, specific problem with them. They are the systems which are based on public goods are susceptible to cheating, okay, or to exploitation. Think about taxes, okay? If we all pay the taxes, everything is great, but the problem is that some people don't like to pay taxes, actually, quite a few. So let's go back to bacteria and, en and enzymes. So if all cells are producing the enzyme, okay? Then, again, this enzyme is secreted out of the cells and makes the public good. Everyone is happy. We have a high growth rate because they utilize some external food source. And seem, seem, things seem to be working very nicely. But now let's, let's imagine a situation where there are only few non-producers in the crowd. Okay? Now, there might be mutants. Okay? In the case I'm going to talk about, there are going to be mutants. And... Uh, these non-producers are going to enjoy the total benefits, okay, the taxes that are being paid by the rest of the, of the bacteria, but they're not going to pay the cost of making the enzyme. So in total, they're going to have a slightly higher growth rate than the producing brothers. Okay? They are the cheaters. They're exploiting the production of uh, the public good by uh, the producing bacteria. Now, this is not a stable situation because now what will happen? What will happen is that the non-producers will grow faster than the producers and eventually take over the population. But here comes the catastrophe. Okay? Or, uh, uh, if you have uh, non mostly non-producers, then no one is actually producing the enzyme. And the total growth rate of the whole community is reduced, both producers and non-producers. Eventually, this will lead to a full collapse of the system. Okay. This uh, type of uh, catastrophe, known as the tragedy of the commons in social evolution, uh, is well uh, 
well, des well described and well analyzed uh, theoretically, and there are various ways in which all sorts of organisms, including bacteria, can actually uh, come over it, okay? And the main, re main way that bacteria probably use, although not the only one, is, is, is basically by, in order to understand that, we need to think not about test tubes, but about growth in a more kind of a spatially ordered fashion, okay? So let's imagine that we have a kind of a community which is full of cooperators that produce the enzyme, and there's one cheater here that is going to benefit from the production of enzymes by other. It's going to grow faster and make its own little colony. But now, because things are not moving very quickly, you'll get a colony which, in, within it, the cells will not feel at all the public good, okay? So they will not enjoy it and will therefore uh, have a reduced growth rate. So basically, by being able to separate, okay, by relatedness, the, uh, the cheaters and the cooperators, cooperators still thrive, okay? And in this kind of a, of, of a view, we get coexistence of cheaters and cooperators over long times. Cooperators always thrive, cheaters pops in, thrive for a while, then they are basically lost, and new cheaters come on and so on. Now, how is that all related to the diversification of communication, which is the question at the end? So, basically, what I'm going to show you now, it's a kind of a mathematical lemma, okay? And everything, by the way, is well-founded mathematically, but I'm not going to show you the mathematics today, but only the intuition about, uh, about the, uh, this, this process. We basically ask, how can we start with a single species of communication course, with 100% frequency, and end up with two coexistent communication systems, each one uh, of 50% frequency, and how can we have strong selection for that? Because the evidence for the molecular evolution is that these things are being selected for. This is not a neutral process. <coughs> so here's the model. It's based basically on what I told you up until now, okay? We have to assume that we have a communication system based on what we know about the way bacteria use it, we're assuming that the communication system is controlling the secretion of public goods. We have to assume, of course, because that's what we're interested in, that we have at least two different types of signals and two different types of receptors, and we can mutate from one to another, but again, one by one, okay? And finally, we will have to consider now the fitness of any mutant in the social context of its parental strain, okay? Because both communication and cooperation are social by nature, and disregarding social behavior will basically tell us nothing about the system. So what I will claim is that among the two different intermediate options, okay, there's only one that can be selected for, okay? And this evolutionary pathway from one language to another language has to go through an intermediate where the receptor has changed first and the signal has changed only second. And I will basically show you why is the first step evolutionary selected and why is the second step evolutionary selected in the next following slides. So, okay, in order to basically think about this story, we need to consider again the interaction between a parental strain, in this case the original communication system, and its mutant, mutant descendant, in this case a mutant where the receptor has already changed. So what happens here? Think again about the production of public goods. This mutant has a novel receptor, okay? This receptor doesn't, doesn't hear a signal, okay? It doesn't hear any signal, actually. It doesn't hear its own signal or the signal of its parental strain, so it's never activated. This mutant is a cheater in the terminology we have just defined. It never produces the public good. So it enjoys the public good produced by the original, by its parental strain, but it doesn't contribute to, to the effort, to the social effort. So it will thrive as a cheater, okay? It will thrive at least for a while. 
actually it's a little bit more than a cheater. It's a cheater and a liar. And why is that? Because it actually still makes the signal that tells the other guy to keep on working, okay? That it still makes the pink sing signal that tells the original system to work even if it wouldn't have worked by its own, okay? So it's a cheater and a liar, but cheating is actually the main dominant feature of this uh, evolutionary step. And of course, we can model it mathematically and show that even if we start with a very low frequency of this cheater, it will basically penetrate to 100% into the population. On the other hand, when it penetrates into the population, it, the, level, the total level of population goes down because, as I said, no one is bothering to make the enzyme, which is needed for growth. So we have a kind of a window of opportunity here to regain cooperation. And one would think that there's a, a strong selective pressure for regaining co cooperation because if you make the enzyme, you, you thrive. However, this is not that simple. And it's so simple because the enzyme uh, cooperation is a public good. It depends on public good. So can, for example, we go backward? If we have now this intermediate st strain with a different receptor, it now took over the population. No one is making an enzyme. Can we go backward and actually change it into the original receptor in order to regain cooperation? The answer is obviously no. And why is that? Because we're basically going back to the exact same picture I've just showed you. If you're in a room full of cheaters and you're the only nice guy, your life is not going to be very, very easy, okay? Uh, it's just going to be cheated by the other bacteria, okay? So going backwards into the original system is impossible, or at least very, very difficult, because of this very simple reason. You will continue and be cheated even so, so you cannot enjoy uh, the production of the enzyme. So that's a problem, okay? That's why cheating is such an annoying feature for social behavior. It's very, very difficult to go back from it into cooperating. Okay, so going backward is impossible. What about going forward? Now we're thinking about not changing the receptor back into the old receptor, but actually changing the signal into a novel signal. Is that the same? In the first look, it looks, seems to be the same. We also have now a, a working, a working uh, strain, which is producing an enzyme. If it, producing a, if it produces an enzyme, then it might be cheated by the parental strain. But this is not the case. And here is where the symmetry breaks. And the symmetry breaking is due to communication. So let's think about it about now about the mutant intermediate. It has already changed its receptor. And now we have a double mutant, which have changed both its receptor and its signal. What happens now? So we have now a new signal in the system, the blue signal. Of course, it tells the novel, uh, the novel system, the novel poem sense in a communication system to start working, okay? And it produces an enzyme. But it does another thing. It actually dictates the intermediate strain to start work as well. Because the intermediate strain, the parental strain, also has already the blue receptor. So now we are in a completely different situation than we were previously uh, uh, when this uh, intermediate mutant was not working at all. Now it is actually being induced to work by its descendant, okay? So its descendant is not only a cooperator, but it's also immune to the cheating of its parental strain. It's immune to this cheating by inducing it to work, okay? And here comes the difference between the old cooperator, which was not immune to cheating, and the novel cooperator, the novel communication system, which is now immune to this cheating. And this is a major point that actually tells us that while these two systems seem to be exactly the same, there's actually a very strong force driving the diversification of these communication systems. Now, there's still a problem here, because if you think about this new communication system, it it is not suffering anymore from cheating, okay? Because it tells its other parental strain, start work as well. But 
it's also not enjoying any benefit under this situation because now everyone is paying the cost of production of the enzyme and everyone is benefiting from the production of the enzyme. So in total, if you start with 1% of this uh, bacteria, you will continue and stay with 1% of this bacteria. It's, it's like it's neutral, although it, of course it's not neutral functionally. And the non-neutrality comes when we think about structured population, when we think about the same type of mixed versus separated uh, strains that I've been describing before as a general solution for, uh, for public goods. Now, if we think about this immune cooperator, then when, when it is mixed with its parental strain, it's immune to its cheating, okay? So it's neutral. When it's separated from him, of course, the cooperator is still making the signal, so it has a, a, a great advantage, while the mutant is, is basically failing. So when we consider this kind of structured population, then the new signaling system has actually a very strong positive selection, and it will be, in evolutionary terms, immediately selected in the population. Now comes the last part of this little uh, problem. Uh, what happens next? Okay, we, let's say that we have already invented a new system, okay, a new communication system. So we had bacteria that spec spoke French, and now we've reinvented the Japanese bacteria, okay? So they have two different languages, but they're equivalent. So it, it's, it's not completely clear from that what will happen. Of course, we know what, happen, what will happen if they're separated. They will behave exactly the same, okay? But what will happen when they are mixed? Let's think about a situation where the new guy because it's new, is only 1% of a population mixed together with 99% of the uh, original communication system, population having the original communication system. What will happen is that actually the minority will take advantage of the majority under these conditions. And it is very easy to understand that, okay? If you have only the blue cells being only 1% of the population, then they will almost not send, they only hear their own signal, okay? And it's very low, because their levels are very low. So they will not make a lot of the enzyme. While the pink cells, which are uh, the majority of the population, will make much more signal and therefore much more enzyme. In this case, it's a kind of a cheater, okay? Because it's not making, the minority is not making the enzyme, and it's enjoying the enzy enzyme production of the majority. So it will exploit it, and its frequency will go up. But as it goes up, of course, it will start hearing its own signal, okay? And eventually, it will turn on its uh, communication system, and will start producing the enzyme and cooperate as well. So at the end of the day, from symmetry arguments, we have to uh, basically maintain the system at uh, equivalent frequencies of 50-50, okay? 50% 50 of each strain, and this is the stable, the stable solution for this problem. Now, unlike a cheater, okay, the original cheater never produced an enzyme. So when it invaded into the population, it, it invaded into 100%, and then eventually no one was making the enzyme. Here, at the end of the day, we have 50% of one strain, 50% of another strain, and all of them are making the enzyme. So this is a stable coexistence, stable from uh, an evolutionary and from uh, an ecological stand standpoint. So basically, by inventing a new language, the bacteria was able to invade into the old population. So to summarize, we wanted to start with one strain and end up with two different strains, coexisting strains, and we actually showed that we can do it very simply and elegantly by three different selective steps. First, by having a mutant, which is a cheater. Second, by having a second mutation, which leads to a new signaling pathway, which is immune to cheating. And fi finally, by a facultative cheating interaction between the new, the two systems, that lead to coexistence of both systems. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay, so 
while I thought this would take a little bit longer, I might actually speak a little bit about like our experimental approach to this problem. So again, we're working with the bacteria Bacillus satilis, okay, which is a very well-founded model system for studying uh, community development and differentiation, and also has a nice uh, uh, communication structure, which is actually built of more than a single communication uh, uh, molecule, but one of these molecules has diverged. So different strains have the same molecule, but changed enough in order to basically activate only its own strain. And we already know that this molecule controls the production of several different public goods. Among them, the main two public goods are a molecule called surfactin that helps the bacteria glide on surfaces. That's why it's called surfactin. It's a surfactant. And an enzyme called pectate lyase, which uh, cleaves uh, pectate chains. Again, pectate is a kind of a complex sugar. And what we're basically planning on doing in the next uh, year or so is to construct all these strains that I told you about, okay, the two different uh, communication systems and also the intermediates, and put all of these systems in a single genetic background and then compete them together in order to see whether our predictions can be verified in various types of social, uh, social uh, context. Now, what we have been able to show up until now, which is very little, is that indeed the system, well, that most likely the system is social, because if you put the, this bacteria in a, an environment where the only carbon source is pectate, then uh, you can calculate uh, whether what is the cost and benefit of pectate production, okay, or form sense at all, and we can actually show that a mutant that has a lower cost will have a higher benefit, and a mutant uh, which cannot, uh, doesn't have the, the signaling system uh, cannot uh, metabolize pectate to the same level as the wild type, so we can calculate both costs and benefit for this specific strain. They seem to be actually pretty high, okay? So this is a system which is amenable to experimental analysis of this kind of social context. On a broader scale, we plan to explore various types of social interaction with this kind of bacteria, as well as engineer social variants of pathogenic bacteria that will be able to invade into natural communities and basically save, uh, 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 basically be used as a kind of a Trojan horse in order to invade natural communities and take over them, okay? Uh, so I want to thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Well, thank you, Avigdor. Um, questions, please. Yeah. Okay, so the, the question is about the development of this receptor, which is basically not functional in its, uh, when it's, 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 it happens, because, because this, the function is, is future. Now, you're, you're right in your general comments. Bacteria cannot predict the future. They don't know that they will have a second mutation, and I'm not implying that in any way whatsoever. These receptors will suffer mutations all the time, because the mutant receptor is a cheater by definition irrespective of whether there's a second mutation that can recover the signaling, okay? So you will have this, and this has actually been demonstrated in, in, in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example, a, a pathogenic bacteria in the, in the lungs of CF patients. You get these receptor mutants all the time because they're cheat. Well, one option is that because it's, it's because they're cheaters. And, and most of these receptor mutations will not lead to a new receptive mu uh, uh, mutant. There will just be like a null mutant, they will be non-functional. But then they will lead to a cheater that will 
basically end, his, end, end its life in the structured population of the bacterial community. So you'll get a cheater after a while, it will be basically gone, okay? And a new cheater will, will rise, or a cheater in a different position. Once in a while, you get this very, very, and it's probably irrelevant, you get a specific mutation in the receptor that can be compensated by a second mutation in the signal. So I'm not claiming the bacteria is, of course, predicting the future. They're just, you know, everything is just random. Okay, so the question, is, the first question is about uh, whether there's any signaling which is between cells in bacteria. And, and the answer is that there is, okay? There are various types of interactions which are mediated on the surface of bacteria. There's just been a very influential, well, a very uh, new, I would say, uh, paper from Sigal Ben Yehuda from uh, Hadassah uh, in Cell showing that actually bacteria from complete different f phyla, okay? Uh, well, not phyla, but uh, 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 families, are, uh, are interacting by small tubes that allow actually transition of cytoplasmic material between them. But there's other w more well-established types of cell-to-cell -cell signaling. It, uh, the functional effect of the cell-to-cell -cell signaling is usually less well understood, but I wouldn't say that there aren't any examples of that. And time will tell what is the relevant example. Uh, importance of one versus the other regarding the who's first, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what mechanism. Probably secretion is a simpler mechanism uh, because they have to receive stuff from the outside anyway and they secrete stuff anyway. You just need to match it. Uh, so probably secrete, but again, this is just a guess. Now regarding the coevolution, the answer is yes. Uh, I was, of course, portraying here an extreme, extreme uh, case where we immediately change into a new signal and a new receptor which are completely orthogonal to the old receptor and old signal. You can do everything by small steps, okay? What you need is that the receptor will lose affinity to the old signal, but the new signal will regain affinity. And one can show mathematically that it's completely equivalent if you take very small steps and not a very la one large step, you'll get exactly the same cheating and immunity cheating behavior. So, so yeah, everything can be done. And actually, at least in Bacillus satellites, it's completely clear that these are not single mutations, but actually the accumulation of many multiple mutations just from, 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 the, from the genotype of these various strains. I think we all need coffee. So uh, thank you very much again. And we'll break now. And we'll be back. Uh, there are some coffee and refreshments outside. Uh,